voice, we are also, you know, I basically also signaled to her telepathically. Um, <laughs> she probably received it. Okay. Um, so Sarah, hi. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Um, how are you doing this I'm, morning? I'm all right. Uh, yeah, it's it's a beautiful morning. I heard the birds chirping out the window. Um, I've been waking up at sunrise, which is a bit Ooh. unusual, but uh, I think goes a long way during these winter months. Mm -hmm. How are you? Um, frenetic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but also just really um, filled with a lot of connection and love and ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, cool. in a tender and a beautiful way. Yeah. 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 I'm in such awe of the nine days that you all have already put in. It's like a transformative, deep space. I just dropped in yesterday, so I feel a little bit fresh. Mm -hmm. um, we need, we need the <laughs> I mean, but y'all are deep in ideas. Like our workshop yesterday was really powerful and um, I feel like I'm jumping into like a really big ceremony or something. Mm, cool. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, um, Sarah and I are going to both introduce ourselves. Um, and then we'll start. So sure. maybe if you could do yeah. you mind starting yeah. introducing yourself. Totally. Um, yeah, I'm Sarah Sutter, and I um, I've been in Portland for the last 15 years. I grew up on the East Coast. Um, I did my MFA at Portland State about um, I started in 2010, so about 12 years ago, and studied uh, poetry and creative nonfiction. Um, and then over the years, published some writing and, and helped to curate readings, did readings locally, have worked with Jay here at PNCA. I also started teaching literature and creative writing in 2010. So I have been doing that for, this will be the 13th year. Um, and then uh, when COVID hit, I had a sort of reckoning and uh, decided to go back to school, bless you. Um, to a program in San Francisco, a low residency program for uh, integral psychology and somatic therapy. So I'm also now in my second year of that program and we'll finish that in a year. So hoping, so in this sort of transformative space myself of um, continuing to write, but also have been in a bit of an incubator with the psychological studies and um, and had walked away a little bit from writing in that capacity, but I'm writing a lot of uh, psychology stuff and, and reflective personal work. And now sort of re-emerging, I feel, into this space that's kind of um, conjoining the two, the creative work and then and the psychological. So, so yeah, so I, I have a hopeful vision of working with clients in a therapeutic capacity and then also continuing to write and have students um, and I love being a student as well. I think I would also continue to be in school if it were um, possible, and maybe it will be, we'll see. Yeah, I think that's awesome. what I've been up to in that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, my name is Jay Hunteri. Um I have been teaching writing for now going on 24 years. Um, it's really just been in the last few years that I've understood that it's that it is a calling for me. Mm -hmm. um, and that my writing practice, there are many ways of that writers be in the place of teaching. So I'm not suggesting this is the right way at all but my writing practice is really just completely combined with my teaching practice mm -hmm. um it's not something i'm not teaching so that i can write um, necessarily it's just they're together yeah. um, um see what else can i say um you know personally like my son is 18 um and he um, was kind of witnessing him, um, you know, stepping out 
Um, um, it's really amazing. Actually, he's something new every day. You know, he's in a relationship or he comes home with a suit. <laughs> you know, like, you know, or he's like just telling me something that I need to be doing. And he's right, you know. Um, he's he's like I parent a man all of a sudden. Um so that is really, you know, something that is with me pretty constantly um these days and also just realizing the beauty of our family shape um i'm no longer married to oscar's mom um but amy and i really sharing um you know uh, this long co-parenting experience mm -hmm. so that feels like part of my biography too yes. you know yeah. um, um and I guess the other thing I can say um, is that I love reading and I love reading books. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Sarah and I thought, I'm going to just turn my phone off. I just wrote to sell it. Um, we would just read. So Sarah introduced to me this amazing Nigerian thinker. Bio of Komolape. Mm -hmm. um, and we both listened to some lectures that Sarah shared with me. And we took some notes. And we're just going to read some of the notes that are actually in the class description and then just kind of go from there. But essentially, bio is reframing how we think about trauma, among many other things, how we think about trauma. So I'm just reading from the description. Bio Akamalafe reframes trauma by reconsidering what it means to be wounded. Wounds, openings of the flesh are not empty. Akamalafe believes they're replete filled with life of their own. I heard him in the last lecture I listened to call them living creations. They are a form of embodiment. He asked, how is the wound a creation event? He says trauma is doing more than just marking or naming the site where the psychic wound is. It is the way we, this is quoting, it is the way we make the wound intelligible to us. I am of the opinion that we are losing sight of the song that bursts through that rift, that metabolic rift in space-time, that there are other things that that hole in the wall or that crack in the sky wants to share or is potentially able to share that we are losing sight of because our vocation of citizens is to close up the rift immediately. It's like getting back to normal. The other thing that we've been talking about that he, you know, really talks about, and feel free to add, um, but just that so that. Trauma is much more than that, the external, that the instance of the external shock, but it's everything around it, how we respond to it, the patterns of behavior that rise out of it. Um, it's, he uses the word correspondence, which I think is really important that I think we can get into, that we are sort of corresponding with traumatic with our traumatic experience mm -hmm. in a variety of ways. And he suggests too that we think about trauma as coming from the outside, but actually that we are born into it, that we are immersed into it from, from the get-go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do you think I've captured I, other things, anything else to add? I mean, he's, yeah, maybe he's so rich. I think that was a great um, snapshot too. And I feel so um, humbled also, I think, to be talking about his work mm. um, as a new student of his. Um, 
I have a couple notes too from those lectures and uh, other things he said that, I, that I'm sitting with are how healing and healing trauma, he calls it um, an opportunity to witness our full human potential. So I think sort of adding on to what mm -hmm. you said about trauma as something that we're born into, it's also actually just, it's a part of our sort of, it's a birthright. I think maybe like a passage, almost a vocational aspect of being human. Um, he also said, uh, he calls it a portal, um, a disruptor of time, a trickster, mm. a potential for the sacred. And, um, and he says, I think sort of speaking to that, going back to normal, he says, don't put a Band-Aid on that crack or that trauma. What if your grandmother is trying to get through? What if your ancestors are trying to get through? So it's so so this reframing in a really powerful way. And then also in the same talk, he you know, he made note that I box uh counted trauma as one of the most commonly used words of the decade. So which made me think of the essay you shared with me, Jay, uh, decolonization is not a metaphor, and this tendency of I don't know what the where the tendency comes from, but where we take language and sort of make it mainstream and then it become it sort of loses all of its meaning. Mm -hmm. So that this is also happening at the same time with the word trauma, right? Like our coffee order, we'll, we'll get the wrong coffee order and we'll be like, oh my God, that's so traumatizing, right? That like <laughs> tendency to sort of over hyperbolically state things. Maybe it's an American thing, I don't know. Um so that the so that trauma has become, become sort of weaponized or overused. And I think on the right, we see it as being sort of weaponized um, and, and millennials as being called sort of oversensitive, for example. Um, and and yeah, but then also this deep devotion and, and respect for it. So it's a, it's a, juicy, it's a juicy conversation he's bringing in. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, he also mentions the phrase shapeshifter. Yeah. A couple of times that we have to become the shapeshifter. Um, and I wanted to maybe talk a little bit about that um, or attempt to talk a little bit about it. Um, <laughs> and I mean, since I heard that word correspondence, which to me, like I think about our letters, by the way, we are corresponding. Those letters are rich. We're speaking to one another, we're listening to one another, responding, posing questions, getting, you know, attempts at answers back. Um, thinking about corresponding to my own like traumatic experience, private but also collective. Sure. Um, and um it made me just sort of start really thinking carefully about the all of the different ways that I'm mm. kind of a moving, um, responding, speaking, receiving from traumatic, you know, what I might deem my own traumatic experience, yeah. um, private and public. And one of, I've also been thinking about the notion of what's emerging. Um, I know there's a lot of speech or, you know, thinking about emergent theory, but mm -hmm. I pay close attention to the sort of emerging tendrils in my life. They feel like the new sort of flesh of um, of um, of that correspondence, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, so, I just wanted to share a couple yeah. ideas about or my own experiences of some of that correspondence, and then maybe I, I'm curious if you have something. You yeah, I, I love that. Um, um, well, I think that the, that idea of shape shifting, I mean, to me, it, it lands with um, this notion that if we see trauma as something that is a portal and it's part of our birthright, it's it's collective as well as individual, it's part of the human experience, then we can't, I think we can't accept that or turn ourselves toward that without sh shifting shape. Right. Yeah. It's it's always going to be sort of changing us, and I think there's an agreement toward unity, and 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 a sort of maybe spiritual participation in the whole, 
rather than this this belief that you're alone or that mm -hmm. we're highly individualistic. It, I think it positions us more toward toward this collective and a vulnerability, a malleability toward being shaped by mm -hmm. by what's happening. And I, th I mean, the pandemic and all, I mean, various pandemics that have been coming to a head, I think over the last couple of years um, have been such a loud example of bringing this language to the collective consciousness of don't go back to normal, mm. right? And mm -hmm. because I think to go back to normal, if it's even possible, is to sort of deny what has been declared and, and what's been, um, and how we've been forced to change or the pain that's been endured, the changes that have come. Um, I don't know if that's exactly how bio talks about shape shifting, but that's how it lands with me right now. Mm. Um, in my classes at UP, we talk a lot about Octavia Butler's work and Adrian Marie Brown's work, right? And mm. Adrian Marie Brown, author of Emergent Strategy, is always talking about how we're we're always changing and we can adapt. We'll always have to adapt, but we can choose to adapt intentionally. And then Octavia Butler, one of her most beautiful, in my opinion, um, phrases was God is change, which mm. I, I feels something that yeah. helps me. And I think speaks to what Bio says too. And he says that trauma is the unknown God, mm. which is such a powerful phrase too, that I'm still sort of sitting with. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking like one of the um, one of the places I was really stuck at was thinking about going through the experience of divorce and feeling really stuck in this place that you know it, it was a it was a act of severance that I was the cause of that severance, that it, you know, that, you know, sort of dwelt like it's basically shame-based. I think shame is kind of, a, is one correspondence that we have, you know. Um, but that I realized was speaking largely to that sense of um, that individual mindset that illusion of the individual as the you know the 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 total subject i think it's also part of whiteness um and privilege um of various subject positions but um one of for me lately this sort of i've been really active and think because also i was thinking about my own family of origin and as a sort of con, like just really hyper focused on sources of severance, mm -hmm. and um, in in terms of memory, in terms of memory, um, mm -hmm. and I've been doing this active thing, and thinking about bio and really mining and exploring connections, mm -hmm. like understanding also that I have a lot of memories of connection and instances of love mm -hmm. and visibility and that you know there there's something there to explore like there's i think this is another kind of whiteness that happens but told you know that whole notion we talked about this in a text you know that like um you know happy stories aren't for literature it's a tolstoy thing um and um really actually letting go of that and exploring joy and love. Um, I think about Ross Gay's work quite a bit in that sense. Yeah. Um, so that has been a kind of new <clears throat> way and just with bios framing for me to understand how, how a kind of correspondence with traumatic experience can, can yeah. grow and, and expand, yeah. you know, or shape it you know, it shifts shape, right. you know, it's not that that connection doesn't tangle, of course, with severance or with, pain. you know, pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's kind of been in my thinking lately. Bio definitely kind of brought that up for me. Yeah, I, I, I can relate to that. I think, um, I think I that brings to mind, I think for me, a tendency in, in writing to um, 
to, to need to tell my traumas and my most painful stories sort of over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that is, a, is probably a natural part of the healing and coping process um, mm. for many of us. And when you bring in this idea of the correspondence and how that relates to your relationships, it also brings to mind some recent shifts I've had in my life with my relationship to my family, my mother for, in particular, I think for a long time, <clears throat> I was really fixated on, you know, where, where the relationship sort of failed and how, and at that point, how I was hurt and, you know, had all this fixation on where perhaps she was sort of, she was failing and in, in what I needed in the relationship and how, and how I was like sort of a victim and I was in pain and not that none of that is real. It was real, but I think that more recently I've been able to learn more about what I've needed. My therapy program has helped me a lot, I think, to learn better emotional skills and better relating skills and have more patience and kind of bring what I've wanted from my mother to my mother. Mm. Um, in particular, we had this really profound experience last year where she she was getting tests for cancer and all of these precancerous cells were found in her body. And it was really scary and it, and it kind of came out of nowhere. And it was a hard year for my family generally because we lost um, six people in the family died in, in 2022. So it was just like an, all from different reasons. It was just a sort of absurd and sad big year of loss. And then in the mix, my mother was having these tests done and, and I just, no one was really thinking it was gonna be good news because of how the year had been going. But it turned out that it was good enough news and she had sort of the best case scenario and, um, and she's not sick. But all throughout that process, she, we were talking and she was telling me how she felt scared and, um, and I was able to sort of validate her in this way that I had kind of more recently really learned how to do and have always mm -hmm. wanted from her. And I've seen that it's almost maybe a generational thing that and I don't think it has to be generational, but I think it is sort of popularly, like I think people of all ages can be emotionally intelligent and validating, but it seems there's more of like collective awareness of this in, in younger generations. But, um, but saw this opportunity as like, this is my mother, part of my mother's trauma that she hasn't, she didn't receive that. So, so if she didn't receive it, she didn't know how to do it. So she didn't know how to give it to me, mm -hmm. but I've learned how to do it. So I gave it to her. And then that opened up these conversations between the two of us where she offered apologies. She named things I never thought she would name. And it was, mm. it was so healing and validating and transformative. And, and, you know, there's still bumps along the way and, it, and mm. it's, it's like a work in progress for sure. But, um, but I think kind of stepping past that place of this is how I've been harmed. Um, this is the whole story and also saying I can continue to approach this in a new way mm -hmm. was really helpful for me. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's complicated because um, in relationships where there is abuse, you know, it, it's, I don't, I'm not here trying to advocate that everybody who's experienced trauma or abuse take the high road and be the bigger person because sometimes that's not the right path, mm -hmm. but it worked out for me in this in this particular instance. So, mm -hmm. um, so seeing it, I think, as a portal to to changing to changing what's happening generationally mm -hmm. um, has been has been really profound, um, and it's it's like liberating. It's a bit liberating for me too mm -hmm. to kind of let go because I think there's something that I was carrying around that was really heavy for a long time, just this sort of anger and resentment and this block. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's a lot to carry mm -hmm. too. Yeah, thank, I mean, thank you yeah. for sharing that. Um, we were talking about a lot of big themes, so I wanted to also make it, yeah. bring it down to, to personal, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I'm curious what you, as we've been talking about this too, um, well, I'll just note too that it feels like we started this conversation 10 years ago. I love book memories. Um, and I, Sarah and I met 
I can get the barista on Alberta in 18. And I had Mary Rupel, Madness Rack and Honey with That's me. Right. It had just come out. And I'm pretty sure that you were talking about Marianne Moore Probably. and Bishop. Yeah. Would that have been accurate? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in a way, and I mentioned this about these conversations this week, they don't just happen in the space. They happen before, during, and after. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering, I've started reading other works through this sort of lens, and I'm wondering what, you know, what you have with you and what you've been yeah. thinking about in relation to some of the works of others. Yeah, I, um, I brought this Kava Akbar book. Do you know? Do you know I, him? I do, yeah. Great, yeah. yeah. His um, that book. Pilgrim Bell. You know, he talks about poems as prayers, which I think is, is something that I'm sitting with. Um, I, which feels really true for me, but it also feels a little bit complicated um, as a sort of recovering Catholic. Um, to return to this notion of, of spirituality and the divine. And I think that it, it, to me, it feels like it pairs really nicely with Lyo's thinking. And um, there was one poem that I was reading this week that I could share. It's called, do we have time yeah. for that? Oh yeah, love it. It's called, There is No Such Thing as an Accident of the Spirit. You can cut the body in half like a candle to double its light but you need to prepare yourself for certain consequences. All I know about science, neurons, neutrinos, communicable disease could fit inside a toothpick with wood to spare. Blow it away like an eyelash or lamplight. Show me one beast that loves itself as relentlessly as even the most miserable man. I'll wait. Barely, they sent down language, filling us with words like seawater filling a lung. You can hear them listening now for our listening. Ask me again about my doubt. Turquoise today and almond hard. It speaks only of what it can't see itself. One chromosome bowing politely to the next or the way our lips still sometimes move when we sleep. Yeah, it's, I just love how, um, I, I, I feel that this poem really speaks to, I mean, this line, show me one beast that loves itself as, resent, as, as relentlessly as even the most miserable man feels like this kind of mind-bending way to think about misery and to think about the human experience, which, which to me feels really resonant with Bio's reframing of trauma, reframing of pain as a sort of um, very human and even love-filled and connective event. Um, and this, you can hear them listening now for our listening, which, you know, I think that this idea of listening also feels really central to what mm -hmm. we're talking about, kind of stepping outside of our, our narratives. And it, it's maybe it's a bit counterintuitive because as writers and artists, it's like we're always wanting to hear that vision or see that vision and, and kind of like hear the voice and go with the project. Um, but I think that the listening outright is so important, the listening for it or the listening outside of the one that's maybe replaying itself. But yeah, listening has become, I mean, I've been, um, and I've talked about this before, but just been doing the work of really thinking about whiteness, reckoning with my own whiteness, and um, also with being a cis man, um, and the need for me to move into, to become a big giant ear mm -hmm. um, and to be a transmitter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that 
to me also is part of reckoning like the, the sort of traumatic, the public trauma of being, you know, European immigrant, white immigrant, and really understanding the presence, the harm of my presence in the history of this country in terms of genocide and slavery. Um, and that listening though, um, and I think about Dow often says, is trying to sort of make that connection between the public and the private. Mm -hmm. That listening has really also allowed me to kind of thicken my own sense of like to see how I am corresponding mm -hmm. um, with, with violence um, and, um, and really listen for more connective instances or really understand how I can be a constructive, you know, how I can be a small part of a larger act of, con of constructiveness, even if that's very imperfect and sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that um, makes me think of a, another line that, that Bio said, which was um, listening is an act of decentering ourselves, mm -hmm. which I think feels so relevant to that idea of positionality and, um, yeah, and, and that the humility of listening um, and, and also by decentering ourselves, then there's, you know, more space is made in, in the center, perhaps, um, for voices that have been more marginalized. Uh, yeah. Do you mind if I, I'm going to maybe read something that oh, I should? Yeah. 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 Um, I brought a bunch of books. I also brought Foucault's novel that I've been rereading. And I think I'll maybe read some tomorrow um, or Thursday. But Atel Adnan is just, um, and this is a book called Of Cities and Women, Letters to Fawaz. And she's basically, you know, traveling to other cities that she does not live in and writing, her friend has asked her to think about women and feminism. So she's constantly writing from other cities and thinking about women in these letters from other cities. And this letter is, I need to find it, but it's, she returns to Beirut after several years. That's where she grew up. Uh, in Lebanon. And after 12 years of absence, the city also being really, you know, partially in ruins from civil war. Um, and yeah, I just want to. Um, Okay, yeah, here it is. So she's out at she's out to dinner with a friend. I'm just gonna read for a few minutes. Let's check the time. Oh, it's 1041. Perfect. Last night I called on Janine Rudis and we went out to dinner together. In Roush, we bought flower necklaces from children who were hardly six years old. Two children were sitting on a low wall. One of them was singing in a voice that might have belonged to someone much older than him. It created in me a lingering grief. Janine scolded the little singer, telling him it was time for children to be home and in bed. A young man passing by followed us to say, Madame, these two children have no home. They have no one. They belong to the street. After dinner, the air was still warm, the night was brilliant, and the crowd strolled silently through the noise from damaged music tapes, whining out melodies painful to hear. A woman rushed up to us, whimpering, crying, help me, help me, for fear of God, help me. Then another leaped 
forth, spun around, shrieking with mental agony. Her madness etched into her face like smallpox. Terrified by her own despair, her hunger, it sent chills up my spine. This is the work of war, I said to myself, as if that could be an answer. In this crowd of unemployed people resigned to misfortune, the chances for these two desperate women to be rescued are nil. I resume my letter. I slept poor, very poorly last night. In the heat, with the window wide open, I listened to the sound of the sea, her breath. I thought of our country, our cultures, this land that has been so mortally destroyed. I must say that Beirut, Beirut clings to me like hot wax, even in slumber. People have all sorts of stories to tell me. They, on, they insist on praising the heroic feats of a war that shouldn't inspire any pride. But for the stories of women, it's something else. The women have kept contact with the earth. If I may say, in the ancient roles of witness and memory keepers, they have surpassed themselves. Their strength has overcome their habits and their prejudices. The, I mean, hard to, I, yeah, I mean, Atel always just, she's in touch often with joy and with wonder of the landscape. Mm -hmm. She for years drew and drew again and again Mount Tam. Um, you know, she sort of easily moved, was moved to reverence. Mm -hmm. And yet she also, is very quickly, without hesitation, to name violence. Mm -hmm. um, and this moment, um, you know, the women have kept contact with the earth, earth, if I may say, say in ancient roles of witnesses and memory keepers. Mm -hmm. That often is what she returns to in, in really intense spaces of despair mm -hmm. is that she understands that she must continue to witness. Mm -hmm. She must continue to write. Painting, I think, is something different for her. Mm -hmm. um, writing is the place in which she, she sort of, you know, deals with, weirdly, the things that language often can't even fathom, yeah. you know, but that sense of that witness and memory keeper, that felt like, like she's in touch with the larger story of how she corresponds mm -hmm. with violence, right. you know. Right. She's acting out what the women, what she sees the women doing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's almost a kind of painterly texture, I think, to that passage in terms of there being contrast between the roles of the women and then, which feels almost like the like the opposite of the city, which is like the war and the government and maybe the masculine in this case, like kind of speaking to that. There's a sort of tension there at least. Um, yeah, the sea too brings in the feminine sure. for her, right. I mean, which she often uh, talks about in all the work, but yeah, yeah that's a good like the observation too. Ooh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And and I think too, the sort of cracks of that glance of that, of that um, tableau that she is describing, some of the cracks of the trauma and the tragedy is the resilience, coming out of those are the resilience and the, the memory keeping, the groundedness, so the, the preservation of the relationship with the earth. Those are maybe some of the things that are anchoring and continuing to rebirth mm. through all of that loss, maybe. She often, and this is in a different book, which I have with me too, um, Master of the Eclipse, she sort of mentions the phrase that she thinks of the, uh, the apocalypse as just happening. It's happening, you know, like it's ongoing. She's named it like, you know, um, Janice. Did she say that? What's that? Around what year did she say This that? is in the 90s. I think this the is 90s. written in the 90s. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
And Janice Lee, um, who's a, an amazing writer uh, who wrote this novel called Imagine a Death, um, you know, uses that as an epigraph. Janice Lee and Brandon Shimoda had a conversation last year in which Brandon, like, really, you know, who's a friend of Atel's asked Janice about that, you know, about that sort of naming. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think part of witnessing is being in that, in that space of truth, in that space of, of naming and acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, but also then like being in touch with the larger array of emotional life mm -hmm. that is we that is capable even in in really difficult times or dire times. Right. Yeah. 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 Keeping it, keeping your eyes open to it, mm -hmm. letting it, and also maybe letting it move through you. You know, maybe mm -hmm. the the continued presence and seeing and the writing and the creating alongside of it is a way to also move it through. Mm -hmm. To sing it through. To sing it through. Which to let goes, it be sung. Yeah, yeah. Back to bios. What is the quote here? Um, we are losing sight of the song that burst through that riff. Yeah. And I think Adnan's work, I mean, the poem that you read sort of are, you know, emblematic yeah. of, those, of those things. And that also brings to mind the, um, how dictators want to silence artists. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I've been thinking about um, Castro in, in Cuba recently and um, the way that I've been reading this poet, um, I sent you that mm -hmm. article, um, uh, Dulce Maria Lonas, and she she was, you know, well-to-do and, and traveling and giving lectures and writing poetry and traveling all around the world. And then when Castro, um, came to power in the 50s, uh, she was sort of silenced along with a lot of other artists unless they were being explicitly patriotic. And she chose to keep writing, but in a really private way. Um, and then toward the end of her life, at least one, one article I read described her as sort of having lost, lost a desire to be public with her art after decades of being it becoming such a silent and personal private practice but it just feels um especially insidious and violent that act of cutting off the opportunity for that trauma to be sung or at least processed and given voice to as because that's such a human act of catharsis mm -hmm. and connection as a way to withstand the the violence right so um so yeah, if anything, it's even more necessary to, to, to have that opportunity to give voice with, with, with more violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna just check the time okay. here really quick. Yeah. Okay, so it's 10.51, maybe just one last little question and maybe you kind of answered this, but um, what is one, sort of really emerging um, tendril for you, you know? Um, I mean, you've talked a lot about how you're sort of moving into the space of really coming back to integrating writing mm -hmm. in your therapy yeah. experience. But yeah. Um, but yeah, what, does something come to mind? Yeah. I mean, just even really like, maybe it hit yesterday. So. Mm -hmm. That's funny because it did hit yesterday. I actually have uh, I had a conversation with um, someone with whom I'm in a new spiritual community, mm -hmm. and we were talking about um, I'm going to participate in a retreat, a meditation retreat with this group, and the facilitator asked me what some of my intentions are, and I talked about. Um, wanting to reclaim writing and my creative practice or continuing to reclaim my creative practice as something that feels nourishing and spiritual in my own. Because I, a few years ago, I went through a big rejection process with writing. Right when COVID was hitting, I was shopping around a bigger book and 
just got all, all rejections and it, and it was and it was hard and I kind of let it get get the best of me and then I um and then I had a hard time getting back to writing without just thinking about the rejection and I and it was and then that of course was the own was actually the more significant loss because I felt like I had lost this thing that was so vital to me which was just the, the act of writing and creating and being with the notebook um, and not being concerned about it as a means to an end or some kind of you know other thing um and I feel like I'm, I've been healing that process so I've been healing that place in me and I'm reclaiming it but it's still a bit of a work in progress um and maybe it's something that we all sit with as as creators like this it's this thing that can be personal and collective and we're in conversation around it but then as we share it with the world um our ego receives validation or we might make money around it or try to be like there's opportunities to have notoriety or attention and i think for me just getting back to this place of having it be uh, like a nourishing daily practice mm -hmm. is something i'm continuing to cultivate do you i mean i'm curious like do is that sense of going on that meditation which i imagine will include a lot of like active uh, quiet yeah um how do you think that might support like how does that quiet support you that's another way to mm -hmm. ask that experience of quiet yeah i mean i immediately think of spacious spaciousness um and a continuing of self-trust mm -hmm. i think which is um something that might have been that jolted with rejection thinking about um well what how do i say this better then how is how will it not be rejected mm -hmm. which i think immediately places me outside of myself mm -hmm. and 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 shakes the trust so instead staying with myself in self-trust and, and spaciousness mm -hmm. that's amazing <laughs> thank you um well i um i think what is really nascent for me is just um i mean it's more of the same thing but it's it's just realizing i think that um you know as oscar kind of like literally the clock is ticking he doesn't even really look at amy and me. <laughs> you know um, I mean, that's what's happening chemically. That, that's supposed to happen totally. at this point, you know. Um, but also just really realizing and seeing what I don't always see, but really seeing how the three of us are a family shape, mm -hmm. despite that it's not a marriage and that yeah. we have two houses. And that Oscar, you know, he's actually the one in a way that has really held us together because he travels with, between us. Um, so really kind of like trusting in that, yeah. you know, and letting some of the other stuff go. That's kind of what, that's yesterday. Yeah. 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 And there's a shape shifting in that. Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Jay. It's been an um, honor and a yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and also just let you all know, Sarah's going to read tomorrow night. Sarah's also teaching our brand new six packet course. Power trio right there. You're all sitting together. Um, anyway, so workshop um, starts at 11, so time for a restroom break. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.